No one cares about us at all. The situation of Gansu earthquake survivors is worrying. Beijing without enough funds to clear snow or help earthquake survivors in deep freeze. China's foreign direct investment drops to near four-year low in November. The CCP's penalty economy is rampant, experts warn of officials pushing people toward rebellion. It's all covered in today's China Truths. No one cares about us at all. The situation of Gansu earthquake survivors is worrying. The opening of today's news bulletin continues to provide the latest updates on the grim aftermath of the 6.2 magnitude earthquake in Jishishan County, Gansu Province, resulting in a tragic toll, with over a thousand casualties and the destruction of more than 150,000 houses. At this moment, the cold and freezing conditions in the harsh winter of northern China pose significant challenges for earthquake survivors. As of December 20, they are residing in temporary tents and expressing fear of returning home due to safety concerns, because bricks and tiles can collapse at any time. According to a video published by Voice of America, some survivors expressed that they cannot go back home. Last night, they had nowhere to sleep, so they slept in the car. The top of the car was covered in frost, with no heating at all. There are approximately 20 children, and for their family of eight, they were given only three instant noodles, expressing, we have been completely neglected. It is noteworthy that, as reported by CCTV News on December 20, following the 6.2 magnitude earthquake in Jishishan, Gansu Province, at the settlement point for the affected villages, the fire department conducted a thorough inspection of each tent, ensuring that each one was equipped with a stove, quilts, bedding, and other essentials. The extremely difficult circumstances faced by the victims of the disaster have captured the interest of mainland internet users. The comments section is inundated with a multitude of criticisms, such as go and see where the donations from many companies, tens of millions, or billions have gone. The disaster victims haven't received a penny. It's all under the guise of national charity, and someone is embezzling. Those profiting from national disasters are never the common people, but, it's pathetic. Some netizens mocked, I really want to help, them, but my money is in Anhui Rural Commercial Bank, and I can't withdraw it. The Communist Party provides one person with one pack of instant noodles. The People's Government and the People's Liberation Army are busy maintaining stability. Where do they have time to take care of you? Comparing the miserable lives of ordinary people in domestic disaster areas and the CCP's generous spending abroad, you can see that the CCP is the true internal and external plunderer and traitor. Xinhua News Agency reported that this Gansu earthquake is the most severe in terms of casualties since the Yunnan earthquake in 2014, which claimed the lives of over 600 people. Beijing without enough funds to clear snow or help earthquake survivors in deep freeze. Historically low temperatures have hit most parts of China this winter, and the national forecast is predicting that there's more of the unusually frigid weather to come. A long-term resident of Beijing with over 20 years of experience in the city noted on December 18 that this winter stands out as the coldest in her memory. Meanwhile, strained budgets have left the Chinese communist regime without enough funds to clear snow from city streets or assist the quake survivors. According to Mr. Chen, a native of Hebei working in Beijing, the financial deficits and insufficient funds in the local governments across various regions have led city sanitation workers to refuse work without proper compensation. As a result, over the past two days, manual shoveling has been the sole method for addressing snow accumulation, with the absence of large snow plows. Mr. Li Hingqing, a U.S.-based economist, said that because the ruling Chinese Communist Party's central government is located in Beijing, the snow there won't be allowed to get out of hand. However, snow removal has become a big problem for many other northern cities in China. He added, the local governments still owe the money for last year's shoveling snow and have not paid the IOUs yet. Then this year, they asked people to shovel snow, but those snow shoveling companies and service companies have refused to provide the services. The governments now have to bring cash to ask them to remove snow. 
China's foreign direct investment drops to near four-year low in November. In November, foreign investment in China hit its lowest level in almost four years, underscoring the accelerated divestment of foreign companies from China amid geopolitical tensions and the country's economic slowdown. Data released by the Ministry of Commerce on December 21, as analyzed by Bloomberg, revealed that the actual amount of foreign capital utilized by China last month was 53.3 billion yuan, 7.5 billion US dollars, marking a year-on-year decrease of 19.5%. This represents the lowest figure since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic in February 2020. These figures emphasize that, contrary to expectations of a rebound in the economy after Beijing reopened its borders, there has been a substantial flight of foreign capital. This has been accompanied by a contraction in foreign trade, a rise in unemployment, factory closures, elevated debt levels for governments at all levels, and a significant downturn in the real estate market. The diminished confidence of international investors is evident. Direct investment liabilities, a key indicator of foreign direct investment, FDI, witnessed a drop of $11.8 billion in the third quarter, according to data published by China's State Administration of Foreign Exchange on November 3. This marks the first time China has experienced a shortfall in foreign investments since the Bureau began recording data in 1998. Despite Beijing's increased efforts to attract foreign investors throughout the year to boost market sentiment, foreign capital continues to exit China. In parallel developments, Wei Li, chief investment strategist at BlackRock Investment Institute BII, publicly expressed this month a waning attractiveness of investing in China from a risk-adjusted perspective. This influenced the institution's decision to downgrade its investment rating on China earlier this year. Li explicitly stated that there are more favorable investment choices in emerging markets outside of China. Similarly, Alex Brazier, deputy head of BlackRock Investment Institute, echoed this sentiment, noting that the slowdown in China's economic growth has fueled a more pessimistic outlook among investors. Publicly available information reveals that in mid-September this year, certain members of the U.S. Congress engaged in discussions with Wall Street financial leaders. During these talks, some Wall Street executives acknowledged the increasing unpredictability of Beijing's decision-making, making it impractical to create funds exclusively focused on the Chinese market using historical data. One participant in the conversation straightforwardly noted that U.S. financial industry executives have experienced a form of awakening regarding investment risks in China. Market strategists at major Wall Street banks assert that, until there is a significant improvement in the prospects for China's economic growth and U.S.-China relations, most hedge funds and active fund managers that have divested from Chinese stocks are unlikely to re-enter the Chinese stock market. Additionally, publicly disclosed information indicates that various private equity investment firms, including Carlyle, have recently adjusted down the fundraising targets for their Asian funds. Some have even suspended fundraising for funds targeting China. Mutual fund management companies such as Vanguard and Van Eck have either exited the Chinese market or abandoned their initial business plans in the country. The 2023 Global Public Investor Survey by the Official Monetary and Financial Institutions Forum, OMFIF, released at the end of November, further corroborates these trends. It reveals that 39% of large funds consider India the most attractive emerging market, while the proportion selecting China is less than 23%. The CCP's penalty economy is rampant, experts warn of officials pushing people toward rebellion. The Chinese economy is grappling with a slowdown, and fines have become a major source of income for local governments, experiencing a remarkable double-digit surge in recent years. Netizens have highlighted cases where small businesses, earning meager sums, are slapped with hefty fines reaching thousands or even tens of thousands of yuan. Meanwhile, the structure of fines is becoming more standardized, with authorities covertly extracting funds to address financial and economic crises. Illustrative cases include Wannan Wenxin Baozi Shop in Beijing, fined 15,000 yuan, approximately 2,098 US dollars, for selling bean curd jelly with sauce on a takeaway platform. 
In Zimadian, Hunan, an elderly man in his 70s earned 12 yuan, about 1 US dollar and 68 cents, selling edible amaranth but was fined a staggering 55,000 yuan, about 7,695 US dollars, by the Market Supervision Bureau. Similarly, in Luoyang, Hunan, a vegetable seller was fined 110,000 yuan, about 15,389 US dollars, for allegedly selling substandard vegetables. And so many other cases. Government fines skyrocket with double digit growth amidst economic crisis. Official figures support these claims. China's National Bureau of Statistics reveals that, except for 2020, the income from fines and seizures between 2017 and 2019 registered double digit growth each year, surpassing the growth in government revenues. In 2021, penalties and seizures yielded over 370 billion yuan, a 19.21% increase, constituting about 1.83% of the nation's total government income. Mr. Tang Jinyuan, a current affairs commentator, asserts that the widespread imposition of hefty fines is not coincidental. He argues, with the economy backed into a corner, squeezing money out of the public has become one of the few remaining ways to generate income. This isn't just a fluke. It's a clear sign that the Chinese government is running out of economic steam. Their only move left is to shake down their own people for cash. Mr. Li Hingqing, an economist at the Washington Institute for Information and Strategy, mentioned that the drastic cuts in government-supported salaries, with many places reducing wages and relying on fines to compensate. He likens law enforcement to using government authority to grab money, no different from highway robbers. Rampant fines could spark public revolt against the government. Right now, the Chinese government's heavy reliance on fines isn't just about making money, it's also a way to keep people in line and tighten their grip on control. Mr. Tang Jingyuan points out that for ordinary folks or private companies, even if you're as big as Alibaba or Didi, the government can slap you with massive fines on any flimsy excuse. Therefore, following the upward trend and downward impact, it will inevitably form a unique mechanism within the Chinese Communist Party, known as the Fine and Harvest the Leaks mechanism. In fact, Fines have already exceeded the ordinary and normal category of administrative penalties and have become a political tool of the CCP. He remarked that the fundamental issue stems from the Chinese Communist Party's origins, rooted in the experience of seizing from the landlords and robbing the rich during its early days in power. If this trend persists, it amounts to placing additional burdens on the economy. This is why it is asserted that the practices of the CCP worsen the economic crisis. Mr. Li Hingqing also pointed out that this serves as an effective method for those in power to benefit from their positions, and this will only escalate. If you examine the history of rebellions and uprisings in China, they were all sparked by lower-level officials pushing ordinary people to the brink of survival. When kind-hearted individuals have no means of survival, what's the inevitable outcome? They are compelled to rebel, and it can only unfold in this manner. Don't forget to comment in the section below to share your opinions on today's topic with us. If you find the information helpful, please share this video with a friend to watch together. This will be a great source of motivation for our team to produce more and more quality and reliable videos. And also don't forget to like and subscribe to see more interesting topics from China Truths. Thank you for tuning in.